Welcome to the Longest Day podcast. I'm Leah, your host and the founder of Broadstairs Consulting. We are an advisory and mediation consultancy, bringing clarity, focus, and momentum to organizations by helping leaders find creative solutions that work. We help rebuild relationships and facilitate effective dialogue. We are convinced that people matter and that conversations count. So we started The Longest Day, a series of conversations where we learn from the resilience, determination, and candor of our guests. As they look back on their longest days, our hope is that it will empower you to look forward. We hope their stories will be a part of shaping yours. Anne-Marie Imaffedon MBE is a keynote speaker, presenter, and co-founder of STEMETS, the award-winning social enterprise inspiring the next generation of women into science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, or STEM, roles. She is the youngest ever girl to pass A-level computing and one of the youngest to be awarded a master's degree in mathematics and computer science by the University of Oxford at the age of 20. Anne-Marie received an MBE in 2017 for services to young women and STEM sectors, and in 2020 was voted the most influential woman in tech in the UK by Computer Weekly. Many of our listeners may recognise her as an arithmetician on Countdown, debuting as part of Channel 4's Black to Front Day. Anne-Marie, we're so glad that you have been willing to join us on The Longest Day. Perhaps you might be willing to tell our listeners about your longest day. The way I live my life and the way I I manage to do so much is I run a very efficient ship. And so it means that um, there were longer days or there are longer days on a longer horizon. But I kind of chew the lessons learnt and the what I should do as a result of the lessons learned from that longest day and throw away quite a lot of the trauma and quite a lot of the story. So I've got, I've come from my first choice, which was genuinely my, the worst 24 hours of 2023, which was broadcast recently on TV across a week for the nation to see. So I'm not going to delve into that one. There's another one that is close contender for worst 24 hours of 2023 that involves some political things that, again, I'm not at liberty to share. So I have my third option, because <laughs> I have a lot of long days. And the thing is, and I'm sure folks that listen to this will, will be familiar with this, is you'll always learn a lesson on the long day. You'll be like, you know what, I won't do that. And I have an issue in that my life is planned so far in advance that then there's a lag. So I'll always remember it, but there's a lag on the learning. And so then it's a while for me to then learn the lesson of that very long day and then have it play out and then you know you evolve I always say kind of you make higher quality mistakes and then that becomes the next long day so this long day starts in Nigeria the first time I'd ever been to Nigeria and I have peaks of activity so you know half term is a peak for our system ets, but also conferences don't happen you know over the summer so there's, there's a kind of a few things kind of added together which meant that I spent an, a criminally short period of time in Nigeria um, and made the choice to fly overnight both times, which meant I had to use two different airlines. So whatever, this 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 day starts um, in the air, having just left um, Metala Mohammed uh, Airport in Lagos. Um, I'd had to come back because I had work that I was supposed to be doing. So I landed at what was probably 5 a.m. in the morning into Heathrow, uh, and my dad was really excited, was really excited and wanted to see me, wanted to pick me up from the airport. Um, and anyone that's ever heard me say anything, my my parents aren't the most fantastic folks with time. And I knew I was running an incredibly tight ship. <laughs> so I was like, no, I'm not going to see you at the airport. So that's all good. So I'm looking at my calendar and I got the train back home. So all the way from Heathrow to East London I had to unpack my bag from the days that I'd spent in Lagos and repack my bag again for that night because I was actually heading up to Liverpool for the Labour Party conference for a breakfast that was happening the next morning. But also I was on stage that day at New Scientist Live. So I had to come home, repack my bag, make sure I had everything for stage and kind of put a full face and full garbs on. And then my dad came and met me at New Scientist Live. Before I got to New Scientist Life, so I packed my bag, got dressed. I think I worked out. I'm pretty sure I did a workout because also I have a, I have a, I have a habit. Like a, you, I, I'm like trying to, you tried to, I, I was very, I became very disciplined in 2023. Not that I hadn't been before, but I, I developed a fitness dip, discipline and this was a Monday and I always start a Monday morning with a good workout. So I landed from Nigeria 
got home, worked out, showered, got changed. I actually did a one-to-one with one of my directs and joined our, joined our team Monday meeting before then heading across to New Scientist to go and be on stage. Did my thing on stage, saw my dad, who was super excited to see me and kind of catch up, and then ran to Euston to get a train to Liverpool for Labour Party conference. And as I was halfway towards Euston, realised that I'd left my coat, which I needed because Liverpool is cold and London isn't as cold. So I'd left that in the green room. So I had to call them to sort all of that out and then got my train to Liverpool, which was probably delayed because the infrastructure in this country at the moment is the infrastructure in this country at the moment. Got into Liverpool and it was kind of a last minute thing, me going to Labour Party conference for this breakfast, whatever thing. that You and me both. And so I think my assistant managed to find what we thought was probably the last uh, hotel room in Liverpool, which was actually an Airbnb. So I met up with a friend of mine who I knew was going to be at a Labour Party conference, uh, my cousin, and had dinner with the two of them. And would, we were done by probably, I don't know, 11, 11.30 p.m. Uh, my cousin lives in Liverpool, so she kind of walked me back to this Airbnb that we'd booked. It was an escape room trying to get into the Airbnb, which was smack bang in the middle of town and just so happened to be above a nightclub. Um, so that was fun and it was up two flights of stairs and we couldn't find the keys so I had to kind of keep going up and down and round got the keys opened the door and didn't realise that we basically booked into like a stag pad if you can kind of call it that so there were 11 single beds in one room and the room was did, had like a fake wall in the middle but the wall didn't uh, join to the ceiling or to one of the other walls in the room so it was literally like a dormitory <laughs> for 11 people <laughs> that we booked <laughs> without realising it and I kind of pulled it out my sister is fantastic pulled it out and I was like these photos don't look anything like the space that I'm in but I have just had the longest day <laughs> And so then uh, last minute booked a room at the Doubletree um, online, managed to do that online at Hotels Tonight or I don't know, other great online booking platforms are available. Um, and so by midnight, where I'd been in the air and gone for all of this, the following midnight I was then just about, I checked into my actual room at the hotel. And that was that was 24 hour period. And that was the third longest day of 2023. And I've had I've had a day I've had a longer day than that I had a longer day than that uh, earlier this week. <laughs> this feels like therapy now, Leah. <laughs> did I mention a book signing? I did a book I did a book signing before I left New Scientist Live. Did I mention that? So I didn't even mention the book signing. I did a book signing. Anyway, sorry, you were going to say something. <laughs> I kind of want to give flowers to the person who manages your diary, but, but I, I think my question is, what was it that enabled you to keep going during that day, especially when you put the key in the lock of that Airbnb and saw those beds? What kept me going? Um... I knew that there was another day coming that I had to I had to do a whole load of... I mean, in fact, I'm going to have a click and see what the next day looked almost the same. Oh, God. Yeah, the next day. <laughs> the next day was coming. That's what kept me going. The next day was only slightly shorter. Um, I know this isn't the question, but I'm going to, I'm going to do it just to give context. So the next day, I did the breakfast at the Labour Party conference. And then had to do an interview for one of the organisations I'm on and also had to do a advisory group meeting as well as having lunch. I led a man our managers stand up. I did an interview for the FT and I did a one-to-one -one before I got back on my train back to Liverpool. The building that I'm in, and I won't say who it is, we're part of kind of a co-working space building, they, they, their door had locked shut. There's always something else to do. I think that's what it is. And so I can't, in most cases, I can't stop until I'm home. And then when I'm home, uh, then it's fair game for me to stop. I mean, that's not obviously not necessarily true because I, I came home after the flight, didn't I? I don't know what keeps me going. I, I have to. I have to. There's things to do. Yes. And that is very much the question behind the question. Because <laughs> there's something about being a visible 
leader and both showcasing your skills and your expertise. But it usually is coupled with an expectation that you will be everywhere and be all things to all people. Right. Is that your experience? Uh, In many ways, yes. A heavy on the all things to all people, lighter on the you will be everywhere. So I think I, it's 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 um it's small mercies that folks know I I can't be everywhere, especially physically, and that's obviously for everybody. I'm not special in that you know post lockdown that's been a, a huge thing to lean into, but I think that being everything for everyone is definitely something. Um, so at least three times, at least twice a week, we could say conservatively, I say out loud, in various different spaces to various different people. I'm not Jesus Christ, I, I'm not here to save everybody's sins. And I say that because, as you're saying, you know, and, and, I, and it's not a, I, I guess there's an expectation and, and I, str- I don't, I, 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 I am held by my own expectations, but not the expectations of others. So I never really feel that that's something I have to, I have to do. It's, it's I've said I'm going to be there. So it's my expectation that I'm going to say to my word rather than they've expected me to be there and they've expected me to live up to whatever it is that they imagined that I was, I was going to do or be or, or whatever. Um, but I think because I do so much, I think the bounds of what things, of what folks think I am able to do or want to do or want to be at, then get very broad, very wide, very fuzzy. And so I think sometimes there's an element of, because there's so much I can do, folks just kind of assumes that, that there's all these things that I will do and they have all these expectations. Um, but I'm lucky that, yeah, I don't, I don't, that's a them thing, it's not a me thing. <laughs> So it's like, it's nice that you think that, yeah. (laughs) My next question is, for those who don't know your story, how has your intelligence and your drive and your determination helped you to be impactful as a leader? Oh, Mm. it's funny. I struggle with a question like that because I don't, if I didn't have them, I don't know, I don't know what that would look like, if that makes sense. So I think the main thing that the determination and drive has helped me with as a leader is that I'm able to, I'm, it's very clear that I'm, I'm never asking someone to do something I wouldn't do or that I couldn't do. So it means that as a leader, there's an element of, of trust and authenticity. And there's this small part of kind of almost inspiration that if Amory knows how to do it or something that Amory would do and she's asked me to do it, then that's something I, I feel empowered or emboldened or supported to step up and to do whether I think the person can do 100% of it, 80% of it, 60% of it, whatever, I feel like that's something that then rings true and allows me to then go ahead and be someone that is trusted by the folks that I lead or someone that is is able to inspire in some way the folks that I lead. Uh, and I say in some way, not in always or even necessarily many, but just in enough that then I'm able to be that leader that can work in different organisations or, or work in op- and operate in different spaces. Um, I think the other thing that it does is it does it gives me it it gives me in some spaces an element of um, either privilege or gravitas as well, and it's taken me a while to reflect on that and truly understand it. But there are, obviously leaders come in all types of different um, shapes and sizes, and the nature of leader that I am means that I don't just wear one hat, and so. It means I bring value to different spaces because I'm a that as well as a this, or I'm a B as well as an A as well as a C. And so folks can can see that it's not just, you know, talk. It's like I'm walking the talk. So I'm over here because I'm walking the talk and I'm talking to you about it, or I'm here because I'm talking the walk and you know, and so and so I think there's also that element that again, if I didn't have the drive and determination, I'd just do the one job at one time. Um and I feel like there's other folks that I engage with, other people I talk to, other spaces I enter into where it's like, wow. So, so, so policy spaces, for example, I turn up and it's like, wow, you're not just talking about this. Like you, you do spend the time with the people or you do see the children or you do run an organisation or you do work on the tech or you do. Whereas there are other folks who are policy head to top to bottom has always been policy. That's all that they do and all that they want to do. And there's a lot, obviously, that they bring in value to those conversations. But it means that I've also always got that leg up, I guess, in any scenario. Um, and again, it's taken me a while to recognise that I forget it often and then I'll have a conversation with someone and I'll be like, yeah, like we did this and then they're like, oh my goodness, and start writing it down. And I'm like, okay, to me that was a norm because that's what I did last yesterday with my managers, but that's clearly not a norm here and that's clearly part of the value that I'm bringing to this space as a leader. 
Are you feeling stuck? Has conflict got you down? Have you considered mediation? Mediation is a confidential and flexible way to resolve conflicts. 86% of all mediations end in a solution, saving time, money, and stress for all involved. Thanet Mediation Center, a Broadstairs consulting initiative, offers mediation services to individuals and organizations in Thanet, Kent, and further afield. For more information or advice, email us at info at broadstairsconsulting.com. We are here to help you move forwards. You're constantly juggling a lot of responsibility. Who around you keeps you grounded and helps you keep going? My partner and my friends and my family <laughs> keep me grounded. <laughs> it's so funny. There's a documentary that came out last week and my dad's in it. And it's really funny because we did the premiere and there was a woman that was like, yeah, you sat next to your dad, you went back to being 10. And it's funny because my facial expressions and everything, it's like I might as well be that 10-year-old whenever I'm in that space with all of them, really, because I'm not special. You know, let's just be frank, right? Um... So I have a lot of people and I'm very conscious to not have yes people around me. So a lot of my closest friends, they're my closest friends because they're those critical friends. They're not fangirls. And I find it very, very, I mean, you'll have, you'll have noticed, I guess, in our kind of preamble we did, I find it very uncomfortable being in the presence of, of that fangirling thing. And it's not because I don't know my worth, it's because I know that I'm not perfect. And I know, I really, really um, value having a sense of perspective and never really kind of ever having my feet off the ground. So I'm always I'm always also wanting to touch the grass. So I'm always also wanting to know what is the norm, what is like, and be really, really conscious of the privileges that I have, as much as there's a lot systemically that I know I have that I know that's kind of maybe working against me. I also know there's a lot of privileges that I have and that I bring. And so I never want to ever forget that because I feel like that also would make me an ineffective leader and, and would reduce my ability to do what I do so well. Um, so yeah, I have critical friends, I have, we have governance structures, I read the horrible comments as well as the positive comments, you know, all of that kind of stuff. But if anybody seems too kind of fangirly, then I, I, I do withdraw. So I like having, you know, I put my, leg, my trousers on one leg at a time like anybody else. So I do, I appreciate being spoken to, you know, with that level of respect of not just the myth, the legend. Because like, you know, I, I forget to drink water. You know, there's all these things, I'm, I'm still a person, you know? Yes, I do. But I also think there is really something in what you've said about some of the systemic challenges that mean that when somebody else sees somebody like them who takes a very similar approach to the people that they have around them, the way that they maintain a sense of perspective and uh, objectivity and determination to fulfil their purpose, it creates an opportunity to be seen. Yeah. How do you bear that burden of being a role model for so many? I I do and I don't. So I think there's an element of I've been really fortunate. And it, and it's funny because it's the wider conversation we have about privilege, right? So like if you're really fortunate, do something with it and don't take that for granted. So I think there's an there's a big part of I would have wasted any talent or gift that I had if I didn't do all the things that I, that it's possible for me to do. And so if that means that I'm doing that thing and I am a role model in the way of doing it, then yes, but I'm not doing the things because I'm the role model. I'm not doing it to be the role model. I'm doing it because it's the right thing to do. It's the smart place to be. Why not step into that room? And if I'm going to be given agency, why not, right? Exert that agency and, and leave things better than I found them. So I think, I again, like I said, it's not, it's not the weight of any... I, I'm never turning up as the role model. I'm turning up as... You said you want me to do the thing. I can do the maths, but actually I'm going to wear my trainers while I do it. And everyone's like, oh my goodness, you know, you turned up as you, authentically you. And I'm like, yeah, okay. I would have really struggled to turn up as Rachel. Like, like genuinely, the blonde is not me in the heels and all she does with that is just not something that I can do. And so I think um, it's a funny one where it's like, I wrote an article ages ago, or there was an article ages ago on the BBC where I was talking about this notion of you can be a bad role model and you can be a good role model. So whatever you, you're doing, you have a sphere of influence. Someone's going to see it and either think it's something to emulate or know it's something to not emulate or hold it later on to make a decision one way or the other. And so like that's going to that's gonna happen one way or, or another, right? There are things I do that folks shouldn't do. There are things I do that folks should do. So I don't, I don't, it ends up not being a weight on me that I'm a role model. Um, 
because I think everyone's a role model one way or another. And, and it's up to you how you use that space and use that time um, and how you wield that influence. As you continue to step into the work that's ahead, mm-hmm. what are you learning about yourself right now? So it's not necessarily new. Um, and it's something that when I talk to audiences and do kind of mentoring or coaching type sessions, I end up sharing with folks quite a lot. What I'm still, what I always, what I don't think I'll ever be fully comfortable with is the sphere of influence that I have and the different options of how and where, um, how and where, not necessarily what, but how and where I influence things. So I always tell folks I'm grappling with this idea of sphere of influence. And the longer that life goes on, the more spaces I step into, the more that I'm learning, right, about that as a muscle, that as a skill of, okay, I'm influential in this space. What does that mean? What does that look like? What does power look like? What is the system? How does it currently work? You know, what are the different levers we have to make this change happen? Um, And I always talk as well about iterating. So you build, you measure, you learn, right? And so it might be in a board meeting or it might be in an advisory group or it might be on, you know, a new methodology, right? That we're trying to work together and I'm trying to influence. And as I said, like sometimes these things have ended up being political because of the types of spaces that I'm in. And so it's that thing of understanding okay, the political machine, like, how does that, how, how are, how do, how do we have systemic, how does the system work, right? And what's the influences that you have over the system? And if you make a tweak here, does that show up somewhere else? And how many tweaks can you make before the system tries to push back, right? But also if you have a government that operates the way the government does, then what does that mean with the, with the influence and the pressure that they can apply on the system versus what they can't, right? Because there's also a limit in, believe it or not, and what the government can and can and can't do, thankfully. <laughs> um, and so, I, so that's the big thing that I'm always learning, always trying to grapple with, always trying to understand. And I guess the other thing that I'm learning is I'm stepping more into chair roles. Um, and so that's the other thing I'm learning is, you know, it's one thing to run a team that you employ. It's one thing to be a trustee in an organisation. It's one thing to sit on a council or sit on a board. But it's another thing to then chair that organization and where in law it's kind of the same thing if you're chairing an organization depending on the entity type it is in practice that obviously means very different things in very different places with all manner of different folks and so yes I'm still but this is the Anne-Marie right when we talk about the VCR player and all the other things of me trying to like break things apart to see what they're at that's literally me doing that now in my roles to be like okay cool so when, when we say that at the board meeting what happens okay and when you when you you know push at that and if you say that outside or if you put that in an email or if you share that as a link or if you you know all of these different um ways to influence and some of them are the same and will always be the same and have been the same on the way up and there are others that you unlock or you learn anew or you face a different type of um colleague not always necessarily adversary um and then there's an understanding that you then have in a different sphere of life you know um so yeah that's what i'm learning at the moment I'm also learning Punjabi. (laughs) That's amazing. (laughs) My last question for you, and I don't know where you found time to do this on this day, but if you had to live your longest day again, what food would you choose to fuel it? Now, that's a tough one because I started in Nigeria um, and I eat vegan. And so there wasn't really much for me to have eaten in the airport or in the lounge before I left. Uh, But the plain food was okay. Um, I'll always, I'll always eat biang biang noodles or I'll always, I'll always eat a bit of pasta. Always. That, that's my meal of choice. Um, if I'm being really good and thinking really strategically, then I've recently got into, I make my lunch now because I'm in the office and around and about so often. Um, so I make a, I make a little Buddha bowl. So I pick a, pick a grain. I have a protein or two some live veg and some roasted veg and a, and a dressing. Um, and they do really well. <laughs> I put some nuts and seeds on it. It's like a four seed mix. You can pick up an Aldi, put that on it as well. And then I pack, a pe- I pack two pieces of fruit each day. And that's my little lunch pack I take to work. And it's really good because it's so nutritious and it's so filling and tastes good because I'm good at cooking. Um, and you can eat it cold because there's no microwave in our office, which is really annoying. But actually I've where there's a will there's a way (laughs) so that's what I would have had but we did have fruit they had fruit in the New Scientist Live green room and on the train I can't remember five almost five I got on the train 
no, this is the wrong day. Um, no, it was almost five the day before I got on the train. Um, on the train, not sometimes they'll give you the good bit of food. Snack, a good snack. That's a good question. All leaders need good snacks. They do. My team regularly asks me if I packed my snacks. <laughs> Thank you so much for talking to me about your longest day. Oh no, is it over? My goodness, that's so fast. Wow. <laughs> Yeah, um, I I want to come and, and hear about the ones that we can't talk about. Um, but I'm very grateful for what you have shared. And I, whether you like it or not, I think you're fantastic. And I'm so grateful um, to be able to speak to you like this. Uh, and I'm very excited to see ways in which we might be able to work together in the future. Me too. <laughs> You've been listening to a Broadstairs Consulting Limited podcast. We hope you've enjoyed this episode. Tune in soon to hear the next installment of The Longest Day. Copyright 2024. Production copyright Broadstairs Consulting Limited. All rights reserved. <laughs>